Can I start by just asking you to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, I'm Andy Waters. I'm a professor of developmental and molecular parasitology at the University of Glasgow, uh, working on malaria parasites, in particular a rodent model of malaria parasites, Plasmodium burgii. Uh, and I'm also director of the Wellcome Centre for Molecular Parasitology, uh, which is based obviously here in Glasgow as well. And what will you be talking about at FEMS? Uh, I'll be talking about the work that we do on sexual commitment in malaria parasites. Um, the transmission of the malaria parasite from the mammalian host to the mosquito vector, which is the agent of transmission, uh, is clearly a critical process uh, in, in the parasite life cycle and is essential for the spread of the disease. Uh, and it is only the sexually committed forms which are capable of affecting that transmission. Uh, so clearly one of the key questions over the years uh, since the discovery of the, of, the, of the full life cycle has been how does the malaria parasite generate these sexual forms? It's a developmental decision that the parasite must make whilst it's in the bloodstream of the, of the infected mammalian host. Typically what happens is that 99% of the parasites uh, that are in the, in the bloodstream are asexual and they are going to invade a red blood cell, grow, divide, lyse the red blood cell, reinvade the next generation of blood cells and, and, uh, and amplify their infection that way. A small proportion of those parasites, the one to 5% or so, uh, will actually undertake a separate and diff distinct developmental pathway, which is then sexual commitment. And um, that happens within the context of the red blood cell and it results in a stable form of the parasite and it's dimorphic so there's a male and a female form and what we're trying to understand then is how the parasite makes that developmental uh, decision uh, and over the years our work and that of many others has homed in on a series of molecules and in particular one transcription factor which is an essential player in the commitment process so without that particular transcription factor, which is called AP2G, it's a member of a large transcription factor family, then uh, in the absence of that protein, which we can uh, achieve through genetic manipulation of the parasites, which is something else that my laboratory has been key in developing, um, then the absence of that protein means that you don't get uh, commitment to sexual development, you don't get the formation of these um, fully develops uh, male and female sexual forms, which the, uh, the parasitological term for those are gametocytes, um, then in the, absence, in the absence of that protein, you don't get those forms and therefore you block transmission. Clearly this offers us ways in which we might then attack the parasite ultimately to prevent the development of those forms as one strategy for the fight against malaria. And if we were to be successful in blocking that protein or processes surrounding the expression of that protein then we would be we would be able to stop the transmission of malaria and clearly that would be a great advance um, so having discovered this protein what we now need to know is how is that protein regulated we know now that it's regulated at the level of epigenetics uh, and so the, uh, the region of the gene uh, that encodes that transcription factor is in what we call facultative heterochromatin and that means it can switch between euchromatin and heterochromatin uh, and uh, that's regulated by modifications on the histones which surround that gene and lie immediately upstream of that gene and what they do uh, is switch between um, switch the marks on the histones which control accessibility to that gene. So they can either be in a repressed state, which they are 99% of the time, or on occasion they're, they're, they're open. So having got, we've now traveled from the uh, production of, of the identification of this transcription factor, which is necessary, to the regulation of the expression of this transcription factor. Uh, and my work now and what I will uh, describe uh, apart from giving some obviously some background during my talk, my, my, the, the, what I intend to describe is the next level of regulation we have discovered, which harks back to um, 
an, an area of research that my group used to work on. So in a sense, we've come full circle because it lies at the level of translational regulation. Uh, and so we're putting together the pieces of, of this jigsaw of commitment to sexual development uh, by a malaria parasite bit by bit. There are still lots of gaps. But now what we've been able to show is that there is a stable uh, ribonuclear protein particle that's maintained in the parasite cytoplasm. And that the messages which are associated with that, uh, the messenger RNAs, sorry, which are associated with that particular particle, when we dissect their roles individually, um, we can show that they are responsible for the rate of growth of the parasite in general and the ability to make either males or females. Uh, and that's all in the same particle, at least as far as we're able to resolve it at the moment. We main um, single cell technologies as they're coming online and being ad and, uh, adapted to malaria research will enable us to answer this in greater detail. But at the moment, what we've been able to show is that this translational repression complex exists. We know the critical protein. We know that uh, it itself is, tr is post-translationally regulated. Uh, and that the uh, post-translational modifications control the ability of this ribonuclear protein to deliver RNA effectively to a ribosome for translation. Uh, and I think we've, and so what we've opened up is a, a, a new layer of regulation of commitment to gametocytogenesis. Um, what we also hope to be able to understand is how this works at a population level. So if on dissection, what we show and have shown so far is that the, uh, those, three, if those three effects of perturbing that particular uh, ribonuclear protein uh, particle, i.e. growth, commitment to males or commitment to, or production of male gametocytes, production of female gametocytes, then is that operating at a population level or is it actually operating at a single cell level? So does every cell make that decision? Or is, it pre or is it predetermined in some way that we as yet don't yet understand? Uh, and so uh, what we need to be able to understand now is the uh, complexity of that ribonuclear protein particle in each and every individual malaria parasite cell in the bloodstream. And with that knowledge, we'll be able to then uh, um, address whether or not the, the parasite is making that, has already made that decision. And that translational complex is simply Again, and if uh, one part of the pathway towards production of gametocytes, of gametocytes or is, is that actually, um, if you like, the central hub uh, through which the decision is actually effected to either continue going around in the, in the cycle of, um, of asexual blood stage uh, growth uh, multiplication division um, and or the branch off to produce either the male or the female form. So um, I hope actually to have uh, substantial data to to what to, to address that last question uh, by the time we uh, come to uh, meet in person. There are other levels of regulation as well, um, and that the parasite is sensitive to its environment. So colleagues here in Glasgow um, have actually started to unpick um, some of the um, proxies that the parasite will sense that are present in the in the bloodstream of the infected individual that uh, in some way give an indication of the health status of that individual. Um, and so it's, nutri it's, nu it's um, nutritional, uh, sort of the availability of, of specific and key nutritional components for the parasite growth. The parasite um, senses the abundance of a particular uh, serum component. When that a component is abundant, uh, it's called lysophosphatidylcholine. When it's abundant, then it's a nutrient that the parasite requires for efficient growth. And so it continues to grow, it continues to multiply, it ma maintains the asexual cycle. In, it, in a paucity of that uh, component, the parasite senses this uh, and then switches to the production of the gametocytes. So that um, does two things. First of all, is the parasite senses that the host is um, not as well nourished as it as it as it is ideal for parasite growth. Equally, if it's not, if that's a signal to the parasite that further commitment to transmission 
and uh, it is and commit and transmission is an investment the parasite makes because it's no it doesn't have to make gametocytes mm. it only makes gametocytes when it's optimal or in cases of, emer- of times of emergency such as malnourished hosts so then it can switch its resources to making more gametocytes in the hope that uh, the evolutionary strategy is then transmission is the, is the preferred option so uh, flooding the system or um, uh, with gametocytes or certainly making them far more abundant than they would normally be is a way to game the outcome towards transmission and persistence of that particular parasite line, uh, which then, of course, is, is a successful evolutionary strategy. It obviously has enormous human impact. Uh, and I think that's why most people start studying it is because they, they understand the, the, the health problem that it causes. Um, but you get drawn in by the biology. So mm-hmm. idealistically, I was there to try and cure malaria, find a vaccine component. Uh, and that's how And I, I've, I've, for my very first postdoc, I entered malaria research uh, and, and, and didn't stray, but being increasingly drawn into the complexities of the biology uh, to understand its basic uh, activities and the processes it uses to complete its life cycle um and a lot of it is just biological fascination that that keeps keeps one going but equally at the back of your mind there is the knowledge that if you understand it well enough then you might be able to interrupt it and therefore uh, go back to the original reason for studying the parasite in the first place is there anything in particular you're looking forward to with the conference well, I mean, obviously, Glasgow makes it very convenient, um, but I think, also think Glasgow is a great city and uh, very much underappreciated by the world, almost. Uh, it was one of the world's great cities uh, in its heyday, uh, and uh, there are traces of that all over the, uh, all over the city. Um, and it, it's retained a, a very warm, welcoming environment. And so I, I'm, I'm, I think that the delegates, when they come, will have a fantastic time. Um, the venue is very close by one of the uh, gentrified areas of Glasgow, uh, which is vibrant uh, at night, um, lively during the day, even more so at night. Um, and I think they'll have a great time. So I'm looking forward to welcoming everybody there. I was a member of FEBS in the past uh, as a PhD student. Uh, for a while, attended some of their conferences, so I know what the uh, the, 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 the federations and the quality of the meetings that they produce can be. Um, so I'm sure this is going to be an exciting meeting, and there'll be a lot of cutting edge science. Uh, and in fact, the person who invited me, Jose Penadas, who's I think one of the organisers uh, and works a few doors, a few floors below me. Um, I mean, some of the work that he's doing is utterly uh, marvellous and uh, transformative. So. Uh, uh, if the program reflects that type of quality, then it's going to be a it's going to be a wonderful conference. Is it just the science itself that you find rewarding? Uh, one of the joys of being a group leader is the scientists that you work with, the young scientists that, that you work with. Uh, and so over the years, it's been I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of extremely talented people uh, come and work uh, with the. With, with the goals that, that, that we have uh, as a group um, to uh, try and understand uh, malaria. Uh, and a lot of them have gone on to um, quite successful careers. And it's seeing these scientists emerge uh, and, and develop um, and uh, know that you've played some small part in that is, 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 is actually a wonderful part of the process as well. Uh, and so, uh, and it's still, great to be able to have PhD students at the very outset of their career, even MSc students and undergraduates, come in and become and see them um, not only become enthused by the subject, but see that the people who are already members of your group are passionate about what they do and transfer that on. So you can see this complete lineage of, of, um, of, uh, of communication and continued um, recognition of the complexities of uh, biology, the mysteries it still holds, why it's exciting and important to to, to understand these things, and um, to know then that uh, this this is a message that I think is for some of these people is actually uh, life changing because they, they do they they do take it very much to heart uh, and understand that um, there is a great requirement uh, to. Um, generate this knowledge and then exploit it.